Inside the Classroom is brought to you by NYSET, a union of more than 600,000 professionals dedicated to education, human services, and health care. NYSET is proud to partner with parents in advocating for what students need. We stand for excellence in public education from preschool through post-grad. Find us online at NYSET.org. Who educates and assists our state students, provides medical care and support, and strengthens our communities? We do. NYSET members are classroom teachers, college faculty and staff, nurses and healthcare professionals. We're cafeteria workers, bus drivers, teacher aides and teaching assistants. We are more than 600,000 caring, supportive professionals living and working in communities across New York State. We are NYSET. We make a difference. Hi, I'm Ashley Dreyer. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Classroom. Today we're going to take you to the National Teachers Hall of Fame, all the way to Emporia, Kansas. At the National Teachers Hall of Fame, you'll see our induction ceremonies, our roundtable discussions at Visser Hall, and get a first-hand glimpse of what the National Teachers Hall of Fame is like. The National Teachers Hall of Fame was started in 1989 at Emporia State University. It honors career teachers with 20 years or more experience. I was so fortunate to become a member of the National Teachers Hall of Fame and be inducted in 2017. It's an experience I'll never forget, and I'm looking forward to taking you for a first-hand view of the National Teachers Hall of Fame. We have a dynamic group of five inductees. I am very anxious to have them uh, introduce themselves to you, so Ashley, if you would give your name and uh, where you're from and what you're doing right now. Sure, uh, my name is Ashley Skurr-Dreyer and I am a high school teacher at Lewiston Porter High School in the Lewiston Porter Central School District which is located in Youngstown, New York. I have a self-contained class of students with moderate intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities and we do a lot of neat things, a lot of cooking, um, language art, it's a language arts based life skills classroom and um, I've been teaching for 21 years. I'm honored to be here today, thank you. Hello, hi, I'm Jonathan Gillantine from Kane'ohe, Hawaii. I retired June 1st as a mentor teacher for the Hawaii's Executive Office on Early Learning as a mentor teacher in the state public preschool program. Thank you. My name is Matenga Regat, and I am a social studies and world language teacher. I taught in Grand Ledge High School. I'm currently an, an instructional innovation specialist, and I teach teachers how to integrate technologies and emerging uh, methodologies. I'm Joseph Rule, uh, but you can call me Joe. Uh, I teach uh, high school biology and a genetics course and a science projects course at Jefferson High School in Lafayette, Indiana. I just finished my 39th year of teaching, and uh, just a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, Bob Williams, and I've been a, a math teacher for 29.7 uh, years, born and raised in Palmer, Alaska. And in uh, January of this year, uh, Commissioner Johnson called and asked me to join his team at the capital city in Alaska, Juneau. And so I am currently the Director of Educator School Excellence. And that division oversees teacher certification, uh, school improvement, uh, schools that uh, need extra support, health and safety, and it also includes Title IIA and uh, teacher recognition programs. What factors should be considered in the evaluation of a teacher's performance? And should student test scores be one of those factors? Ashley, we'll start with you. I think the test scores can be one of the factors. I think they should be a small part of the factor. So I think that in New York State, for example, we have a law right now that 
test scores will be 50% of a teacher's evaluation. Do I think that that's fair to teachers teaching in large urban school districts like the City of Buffalo schools or the City of Niagara Falls schools? Absolutely not, especially when there's um, mitigating factors that are going to influence students' test scores, like the issues we've talked about with poverty and whether or not students have eaten breakfast that day or have had a proper night's sleep. I think that that would be, um, that would be wrong. However, I think that test scores can play a small role in teacher's evaluation. I think that other things that are important to consider, um, like we're doing at Lewiston Porter Central School Districts beginning this fall, we're having a peer collaboration program. And so what we're instituting is uh, teachers pairing with other teachers to go in and observe lessons, and teachers are being trained over the summer, over uh, one or two training sessions, on how to kind of use the clinical observation model and look at their colleagues' work and then have a debriefing session where they get together and talk about what they saw in the classroom. And that'll continue, that partnership will continue throughout the year. It's not evaluative in any way with our administration. It's just teacher to teacher in a professional learning community um, talking together about what they see and in, in instruction and assessment pieces that um, they see in the classroom. And um, there'll be a form that we use to kind of guide our discussions. And I think that those are the kinds of things that teachers can really walk away from the evaluation process learning something new. Learning something new from a colleague about something they could have done differently in the classroom, whether it's a stronger anticipatory set to hook students in and really get them involved in the lesson, whether it's a new way to implement technology and student response systems in the classroom. Um, I think that that's um, an important piece of teacher evaluation and ongoing teacher evaluation to also have, have that. Um, I also like, um, we used to have a portfolio assessment that we did that was based on Danielson's uh, frameworks for teaching. And we would have different components to that that we would uh, talk about in our portfolio. And I really like uh, using a portfolio for teachers to be able to show um, some sample lessons they've created or assessments that they've given and maybe a formative and a summative assessment to show that, you know, this is the way I see how students are progressing throughout a unit and then how I see um, what they did at the end of a unit. I think um, as it's also important to um, evaluate teachers beyond what they do in the classroom, but what do they do in the community? So what are they doing to connect with families? Um, what are they doing to reach out to families? Are they doing extracurricular activities like coaching? That's all part of the teacher's role, is really um, getting to know the students outside the school day. I know in my classroom we have two or three, um, sometimes four family dinners a year where uh, students prepare a meal and we'll have 40 to 50 people come into our classroom. It's parents and grandparents and siblings. And I always put, uh, put something in my portfolio about that, the, the invitations that I sent home and pictures from the event. And I think that those are important things because that was somewhat of a summative assessment for my students on a cooking unit that we did on meatballs, for example, when we had the spaghetti dinner. And I think that having a portfolio is a great way for teachers to showcase their work, but also for us to present those and learn from one another in a professional learning community is a key to developing our teachers and growing our teachers. So while standardized test scores may play a small role in a teacher's evaluation, it should only be a small role. The other thing that's happening in New York State is we have outside observers playing a role of up to 20% in a teacher's evaluation. Now an outside observer may sound like a good idea to you, but that's someone coming in that really doesn't know the teacher, they don't know the teacher's classroom, and they really are, they may or may not be familiar with um, the students that we have in our district. Uh, they could be a principal from another building or an administrator from district office that possibly doesn't know that a student is resting on a map because he just had a seizure or something along those lines and they could walk in and, and misunderstand uh, the situation in a classroom. So I think that we need to be careful of things like having outside observers play too significant of a role in a teacher's evaluation. We need to be very careful of having standardized testing play too great of a role in a teacher's evaluation. And we need to make sure that we're using methods to evaluate teachers that 
encourage collaboration amongst colleagues rather than competition. So a uh, peer collaboration system like we're implementing at Lewiston and Porter is an excellent idea that will yield amazing results for our district. And those are the types of things that we need to look toward as models for our teacher evaluation systems. Thank you. Jonathan? Ken, several years ago when Hawaii um, adopted this new teacher evaluation system, they included um, standardized assessment uh, results as part of the, of the overall view of how teachers were doing. But thanks to vocal teachers, our teachers union, and we even had some support from the legislature and more recently uh, with the governor that we helped elect, uh, there's been a lot of pushback and, and I actually don't recall if that has been significantly reduced or eliminated altogether because of that um, both external and internal uh, pushback on that idea. What we do need to use, I think uh, Ashley touched on it, is to is to not just to say these are the tools we're going to use, but to to empower the teachers to say to them, I want, you know, the parallel with students and their meaningful learning is very notable here. What do you think you do well? What do you want to show us? Um, what challenges have you overcome? What professional development experiences have you had? What successes have you had? And to be able to show uh, in, a, in a bigger picture rather than just that number to say this is where I shine and when we do that teachers kind of have that ownership you know we're such good show soldiers that we follow the rules but to be able to say think outside the box what really uh, sparks your enthusiasm and your passion in the work that you do show us that So again, uh, I think an evaluation for whether it's uh, of the teachers uh, or again evaluation of the student is not meant to catch the student or catch the teacher being bad. Mm -hmm. It's really meant, I hope, to um, uh, help that teacher reflect on their practice. And so um, I think evaluation can be a really powerful tool if again it's not uh, all encompassing and, and it's not, again, a standard of, across the board. I, I would love to see an evaluation system that is more department-based rather than state-based, simply because the teachers from school A may have such parent involvement that they're just producing these marvelous children and getting evaluated beautifully, while the, the teachers in school B may not have that kind of support and have to do a lot more heavy lifting but they are still getting standard, like the same evaluation system. I would love to see more departmental um, evaluation because I believe that if I am evaluated by someone that I trust, mm -hmm. that is gonna be more meaningful in my growth than being evaluated, evaluated by this process that really is so removed from my, uh, my everyday experience. So what Ashley mentioned, this idea of exhibition, this idea of showing, I get to show what my students can do every year I'd rather be judged by this is what my students started with and this is what they can do today. I'd like, to, I, I'd like for them to uh, be, or teachers to be judged on what they contribute to the school and what problems have they solved. I mean, we have so many uh, issues in our schools today, yet the teachers are very, very so busy that they don't have time to just look at the smallest problem and go, okay, let's just figure out how we can resolve this, even though they do this in their classroom all the time. So as a community, how have we resolved this? And so I'd love the science department to come to the social studies department and evaluate, and the social service department to go to the math department and evaluate, rather than having this um, uh, you know, alien entity come in and evaluate something that they can't see. But again, an evaluation from a person that I trust, and f or from a group of teachers that have um, a lot to gain from me being a better um, practitioner is much more valuable. And I know that it's a lot easier to just put a check in that box by making these huge overarching evaluation scores. But again, I'd like to uh, ask us to examine, er, examine our goals because we see, like Bob mentioned, in this high-producing countries, they're <laughs> not testing kids. In the high-producing countries, Teachers love their job because they are, they, they are respected. 
So the way to respect the teacher is not to make them the boogeyman or to take away their salaries or take away their benefits. The way to respect the teacher is to allow them to teach and to trust them that they're gonna be evaluating and they're gonna show you how best they have you know, they, they've, uh, um, progressed. So uh, that's my take. Thank you. I like those ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, in our school, we have 2,200 kids in the upper four grades. So in the science department, there are uh, 15 of us, mm -hmm. and there are, I believe, six of us who teach biology. There aren't enough rooms for everybody to have their own room that they're in all day. And so we're in and out of each other's rooms, classrooms all the time, and we see one another teaching all the time. And so what happens oftentimes at lunchtime, then we all eat together at lunchtime in one of the classrooms at a big table. And I really believe none of us is as smart as all of us. And so what happens a lot of times at lunch is, oh, I noticed you were doing this thing. I, knew, I noticed you were doing this activity teaching the parts of the cell. And I really like that activity. Now, how do you set that up? And, and we're always informally observing one another and it's a trust relationship mm -hmm. and evaluating one another. Now, I have to hand it to our administration in our school corporation. Um, standardized test scores are a small percentage of the teacher's overall evaluation. Now, I don't know exactly what the small percentage is because I'm, I'm a grizzled old veteran and I don't worry <laughs> about it. Um, but uh, it's, it's very small, but one of the one of the checklist items is we are throughout the year expected to insert in our file or in our portfolio um, a certain number of uh, evidences of collaborating with colleagues and sharing teaching ideas with colleagues and, and I really have to hand it to our administration for um, putting that into the uh, some of the evaluation criteria but actually, you said there was one school corporation in New York somewhere. Fifty percent of the evaluation was based on yeah. standardized test scores. It's a statewide. It's a, it's a law now that fifty percent of the teachers' evaluation will be okay. based on the test scores. Okay. So it's it's actually a law, state law. And, and I shudder when I hear yeah. that. And I'll tell you why. And I'll I'll use fictitious names. We don't really have a biology teacher in our school named Matinga, but I'm gonna use the word, the name Matinga. Okay, Matinga teaches uh, ninth grade regular biology. Over half the kids in her class are, have IEPs. The goal of those kids is to walk across that stage at graduation and get that high school diploma. That's their goal. And many of them just barely squeak by. Down the hall, Joe teaches uh, a ninth grade honors biology. And those are kids who come from uh, intact homes where they've been read to since they were fetuses, literally. Um, they've been encouraged and, and reminded constantly how important school is, and many of them have internalized their locus of control, even though they're only ninth graders. And to them, it's very important to learn. It's very important to get good grades. Many of them, as ninth graders, are already talking about, I want to someday get a PhD in something, whatever, whatever. Their test scores are yep. out the roof. Um, is that really fair to base, you know, uh, Matinga's evaluation on 50% of those standardized test scores? and Joe's evaluation on 50%. Uh, so I just shudder when I hear that. We, we need to turn some things around. Yeah, very scary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I'll just say, I think in, in terms of effective teaching, I think, I think performance matters. And uh, we, need high, we need to be able to attract and retain highly effective teachers, and we need to make sure that we're bringing the supports to have highly effective teachers. Uh, standardized assessments as, as, as a way to evaluate that, I, I'm just not convinced. Um, a previous governor in Alaska floated the idea of, uh, and pushed for the idea of having 50% of a teacher's evaluation on, on 
uh, state test scores. And I, I was one of five state teachers of the year that helped gather together and write an op-ed strongly opposed to that. And the reason why is I'm just not convinced that it will build capacity, improve quality, or build trust anywhere. Uh, I, I spoke to a teacher from another state that was in a system that was doing something like that. And because that teacher was a music teacher, they, they I think, was randomly assigned students, maybe even students that that teacher didn't even have, and, and then put it as, and that's, that teacher went from being almost exemplary to just almost not even, uh, almost uh, just barely above proficient. And so if you have a system that treats teachers in arbitrary and capricious, capricious ways, that, that's not going to build trust. It's, it's not going to improve. And, you know, I am, this is a little bit radical, but I'm okay if we had a kind of a, a an evaluation system like the, the show Survivor, uh, the reality series. If, if, if an entire staff comes together and goes to tribal council and writes down the name of one person and that person is, 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 is basically not, is feels like they've been there long enough or they don't have to they don't not gonna have to work or they don't really they're not showing a care if everyone writes that down I'm fine but that it I just think is leading with the wrong thing it comes down to the idea if you if you come opposed to having evaluation of standardized tests maybe you're for keeping bad teachers and I just when we talk about doctors or firefighters or engineers it's just not a good way to lead uh, let's let's talk about bad engineers or bad firefighters or bad doctors but it we need ways that, that make sense and I just um, student learning is very important. Student achievement is very important. But thinking that we can link it all together in, in ways that Joe described, uh, there's some there's some issues with what's fair. And we want to make sure we want people to work with our most challenging students in meaningful ways. The other thing is that this leads to the kind of things where we feel like we have to test every single grade. Yeah. You know, that was a big debate. But we ha and. and we get plenty of information, more data than we need, just from the NAEP scores. That just tests grades four and eight. We know an awful lot of information. So the, uh, the inclination that we've got to test every single grade and we're going to get all this uh, in order to get the information, we've got to link everyone up, I just, I, I just don't have the confidence that it works and I don't think it builds trust, capacity, or quality. Okay. But that whole idea that, uh, I'll, I'll take something I do believe in, the National Board Certification Assessment. Um, had to turn in a portfolio showing how you could work with students that are struggling, students that have special needs, uh, working with the whole class, had to have a videotape, had to have really reflective thoughts on it, working, have it, you have students work in small groups, you go in and you take a, a very deep, deep assessment on your, I felt very good about that assessment. And, and so I think we need to promote more things like that is going to do a lot more to build the types of attract and retain teachers than these, the idea of like, we're just gonna look at a test score and um, make evaluations of that. Peer review. Yes. Peer review is, is, is very powerful. Yes. And actually, a lot of evidence showing that it removes more ineffective teachers than a lot of other things. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for the audience uh, listening to this, now you know how wonderful and awesome and how odd we are by this class of new inductees. You can rely on your union. We're always by your side, safeguarding your workplace rights, advocating for fair pay and benefits, and ensuring you have a voice on the job. You work hard. Isn't it nice to know your union works hard for you? You and your union. Together, we stand up for our students. We strengthen public education and health care. Together, we make a difference. Our inductees into the National Teachers Hall of Fame for 2017, Ashley Skura Dreyer. Ashley, standing, look at that standing ovation, Ashley. Jonathan Gillantine, Matinga Rugatz. Matinga, yes. Joseph Rule is our fourth inductee tonight. From Palmer, Alaska, Bob Williams. Bob, welcome. Our five inductees for this year. I want to send a heartfelt thank you to everyone involved in the learning process in our public schools across the country. And I know that Saul mentioned this 
earlier, um, but I would love to thank our teacher aides and assistants, our secretarial staff, our bus drivers, our monitors, our custodians, and our healthcare professionals. In New York State, we call them our SRPs, our school-related professionals, and I've also heard ESPs, and um, we are so grateful to have you on our team. Transforming students' lives begins for the better. It begins with us, the teachers and the SRPs, working together across the nation to meet the needs of all school children. Just as the navigators use traditional tools to find their way, stars, winds, currents, and waves, we who are teachers also use elemental tools in our work. Trust, care, a keen eye, and wisdom to support children and families as we learn together. People will quote you, they will disagree with you, they will glorify you and vilify you, but about the only thing they will not be able to do is ignore you, because you will change things. You will push people for, uh, forward, move people, and while some may view you or see you as the crazy diva, others will see that there's a little genius in you. I can think of no higher calling, no higher calling than that of being an educator because we shape the lives of future generations. And because we shape the lives of future generations, we have the ability to literally change the world. It's an awesome responsibility and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be a part of that. Getting into the National Teachers Hall of Fame is different than I expected. I, I thought it was going to be a finish line. I thought it would be, you know, now I can rest. Uh, there's, there's, I, I finally made it, and, and now I can just rest for a good long time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm very honored. I'm very grateful. But, but I have to say I'm not satisfied. Um, I won't be satisfied with my work in public education until we see equitable outcomes for all students across the United States. To our five honorees and to our esteemed panel, uh, safe travels home, safe travels to all of you. And that's our induction ceremony for 2017. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we'll get back together again next year. Have a good night. you started early. We stay with you in middle school. We see you through graduation, college, and beyond, realizing potential every step of the way. We're New York State United Teachers, 600,000 professionals dedicated to excellence in public education. But that's not all. We also provide health care and human services to New Yorkers of all ages. We're NYSET, caring for patients, working for students, working with our communities.